start recording again. There we go. Okay. So you're referencing, so you're referring to Especially like for this part here. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay. I guess you do define it up there. Okay. I was just imagining down in like 4.2. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we have F0 union E1. Right. And then the next question just refers to F1 now. And so I guess I was really going back to it. Oh, okay. Yeah. F1 is you know, F0 minus the set that has E0 and a union. Yeah, but this part is this part is specific to only this style of asking the question, so I may not be using the same style in this exam anymore. Yep. So in yeah, so in case of you know, any questions during the exam, you can always you know, come to me and ask for clarification. Yep. Uh, so I'm looking at four point two. It says so when blockers for E zero are removed. Um. Okay. So we worked on these you know, one by one. So one, two, three, and four are all requirements that we have to meet. So um, you can find multiple options for number one, but some of those will not work for two, three, or four. So by the time you're done with one, two, three, and four, you need to find a solution that works for all four. Does that make sense? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we need to make this false. So in order to make this false, so okay, so what do we want to make false? Um, we basically want to find um, a case where you know, both D and X, um, two different things from the domain that match to the same thing in the domain. In other words, when this is false, uh, F1 is not So that's the requirement basically specified by number two. So when, when you work on E1 and E0 from the first two, you also have to make sure it meets the requirement of D and X. So one, two, three, and four, they all need to be met at the same time. Okay. So the quantifier's expressible, or the quantified expression of your four point four, is asking: We need to find something in the codomain so that it is not the case that something from the domain maps to it. That's basically what it's asking. So that means we are: If this is true, then it is not a surjective. Okay, so let me say that one more time. When 4.4, when this quantified expression is true, that means f1 as a function is not surjective because something in the codomain, which is our D, is not mapped to by anything from the domain. There's no mapping to that particular element in the codomain. Is that okay? All right. So the bottom line is, you know, in, to prepare for the exam, um, there are a few really key elements. One is to understand set notation. There's no getting around this one. So set notation is one. The second one um, has to do with what a function is. So what are the requirements in order for a subset of the Cartesian product between what is proposed as, a, as the domain and what is proposed as the co-domain to be a function? So what does it mean when you know, a subset of the Cartesian product is a function? And then we have injection versus surjection versus bijection. Now bijection is pretty easy because it, it just means it is both an injection and a surjection. Okay? So those are one. And then there's the other side has to do with the notation, which has to do with set notations and also quantifiers. So being able to read nested quantified expression becomes you know, also something that is important in this exam. And that is intentional because you know, I do want you know, the class to kind of develop the familiarity with uh, reading quantified expressions. 
Now, one thing that can potentially be helpful is to ask Chat and GPT to explain you know, one of these quantifiers, and then you'll kind of present, you know, you, you have to provide a little more context, okay? So you can basically say if F1 is a function, A is the domain, and B is the co-domain, what is this particular quantified expression is trying to say when it is true? So I am, I haven't tried it yet, okay? But I have a suspicion that ChatGPT can actually answer that question and in a very step-by-step -step manner. So you can give it a try, okay? I'm not sure, I haven't really tried that one yet, but you know, I know that you know, this kind of question, you can, you, can, you can even plug in the entire question and see how, you know, how far ChatGPT will go you know, in terms of answering it. Oh, so you already tried chat GPT on this one? I think it's chat GPT for one that's not as well. Ah. Uh, okay. Not always the key that you're talking about. Okay, so that was another hand. Let me turn it. Yeah, yeah. the chat GPT didn't uh, do it uh, for any both cases. So maybe it's just the first time it's different. But okay. It's Because I think it's having problem understanding that these four conditions have to be met at the same time. Okay, all right. Okay, any other questions about chat GPT? But you can still ask it about a particular quantified expression and ask it what that means and to give you examples you know, also. All right, so are we Doing okay or not? Okay. All right. So I'm gonna hide this for now, and then we'll go to the module. No, nope, this is not where we are at. You know, don't worry. We'll get to it eventually. So what we are doing today is we are continuing with relations. We talked about, I think one or two, I think we talked about two on last Monday. So we'll go ahead and continue with that discussion. All right, so the two properties of relation that we talked about, the first one is reflexive, and then the second one is symmetric. So I believe we talked about these two, is that correct? Okay. So what we'll do today is to talk about the other two or three, okay, depending on how you look at it. This is transitive. So a relation R over a set X is transitive if and only if the following is true. Okay, so that's kind of the standard format of how I describe a property. And this is the quantified expression. So let's figure out how we read this one. So it says for every way that you can choose three elements from X, now, when I say choose three elements from X, those three elements can be the same, okay? They can all be different. Two of the three can be the same, okay? So any one of those combinations. Think of this as a triple loop. The first loop is just iterating all the possible values for E. The second loop, which is nested, is going through all the possible values for F. And then the innermost loop is figuring out all the possibility of G. So you're basically looking at every possible way of selecting elements out of X in order to give values to the three variables E and F. Is that okay? Okay, all right. So by the time you get to this statement here, we just need this to be true because this is a universal quantifier, which means that we need everything to be true because it's a one gigantic conjunction of, you know, the innermost part of this, you know, with the values of E, F, and G, you know, bound to something in X. All right, so we have an implication here. So one thing you do need for the exam, okay? We are not gonna have relation in this exam, but we will have implication in the exam. 
So you have to remember what implication is. In some way, it is very simple. It's just an operator with his own truth table. And I would prefer to see it that way. It's just an operator, and the truth table is already discussed in this class. And if you think that, okay, I may not remember that you know, when I'm in an exam, then put that in the notes that you're bringing with the class. Okay, remember it's open book and open notes, but everything needs to be on paper. So you still have time to prepare you know, what you want to bring to the class. All right, so in here, it says you know, we want EF in R and FG in R to imply EG is in R. Okay, so now we can look at a few examples. So let me get Joplin back because Joplin, we already have a few examples in Joplin already. So I want to continue to use Joplin for that purpose. So let me close this and define Joplin. There we go. Okay. So we want to go back to the Joplin on last Monday. So that will be the 23rd for this class. Okay, 440. This is the 23rd. Okay, so you can focus on the right-hand side when I'm working on the left-hand side. So now we can go through the same thing, and we want to ask, is this R um, transitive over X? Okay, so from your perspective, you know, this is what we are trying to figure out. Is it true or is it not? Okay, so this is a very extreme case because you know this is kind of what we call a boundary case where X is an empty set and R is also an empty set. When X is empty, R is bound to be empty because R has to be a subset of the Cartesian product between X and X. So when X is empty, the Cartesian product is guaranteed to be empty as well. So what do you think? What happens to a for all or a universally quantified expression when there's nothing to go through? There's not a single iteration to go through because there's nothing in it. The default value is true. Very good. Because true is the identity of conjunction. And a universally quantified expression has a default value of the identity of conjunction, which is just true. Okay? So this one is true. Okay? which is not surprising you know, because you know, it is also symmetric, you know, so we kind of get the idea that it is probably you know, um, transitive. What about this one over here? Is R transitive? So we are looking at the case when X has one single element, which is A in it, and R is also empty. What do you think? So let's take a look at how it is defined. Okay, so I'm going to switch back to the notes here. And transit transitivity is defined like this. And this time we do have one single element in X, right? So that means the only iteration of a triple loop or a triple nested loop is when E, F, G are all A's. Because that's the only element that we have in X. Is that okay? So by the time we evaluate the expression you know, here, E, F, and G are all element A. So we are really asking, is AA in R and AA is in R imply AA is in R? What do you think? Well, first of all, is AA in R? No, because R is an empty set. So that means this is false. Well, guess what? That's all I need to know. The implication is true. Yep. This f doesn't make this part of a. Say again. This f. F. What about it? Doesn't relate to the function of a. No, it does not relate to function. That is correct. So in this context, you know, e, f, and g are just variables, and each one has to bind to a an element in x. That's the only restriction of what e, f, and g can be. So in this case, because X is a set with only one element, which is A, so that means the only iteration I get to evaluate is when E, F, and G are all A. So the first question is, is AA as a two-tuple in R? Well, we know R is empty, 
So that means nothing. There's nothing in R, which means this portion is false to begin with. And that's all I need to know. I know the answer is going to be true. The implication is going to be true. So how do I know the answer is true so quickly? Then the conjunction has to be false. And when the left-hand side is false, I don't need to know what the right-hand side is because if the left-hand side of implication is false, the implication is guaranteed to be true. So that's when I go like, oh, okay. Since that's the only way to go through, the, the only iteration I need to go through, so that means you know, in this case, um, this particular R is also transient. So now we look at uh, the other one, this one here. Okay. So in this case, you know, there are two subcases. So now I'm just going to add to this and say, okay, it is reflexive, and is it is it okay? So let's answer the current question first. Is it transient? So we are looking at this case here. X has A, B in it. R has A, A as a true tuple. It also has B, B as a true tuple. Is it reflex? Is it transient? A better question to ask is, do we have any evidence that it is not transient? Okay. Hmm? It is not empty. <laughs> it is not empty. So in this case, it is actually transitive. This one is transitive. And well, since we are here, might, we might as well also answer the question, is it also symmetric? What do you think? Is it symmetric? Symmetric means you know, A, B in R is if and only if B, A is in R. So it is also, it is symmetric. Okay. So this one is so far everything that we are asking for. It is reflexive, it is transitive, it is also symmetric. What about this one here? Is this one transitive? And so this time it is a little bit tricky. Okay. The answer is yes, it is. Okay, it is transitive. So you can have E and F being um, A and A. And then F is A, but G is B. How does it work that? Okay? Because you know A A and A A imply excuse me, A A does exist, A B does exist, and then A B also exists. So it's just it doesn't have a problem with that. So this one is definitely also transitive. Oh, wrong keyboard. So this one is definitely transitive, but it is not symmetric. It is not symmetric because symmetry means you know um, x y is in R if and only if y x is also if and only if y x is in R. In this case, we have a b in R, but b a is not in R. So that makes the if and only if false. But since we can find one case to make it not true, so that means the whole thing is not symmetric. Hmm? Say again. You mean for symmetry? Okay, so the way we work on symmetry is kind of like this. Okay, so if I want to do it by detail, so symmetry means you have to go through the double loop. So on the, okay, let me see what symbol I use for symmetric, E and F, okay. So that means, you know, in this case, you know, on the outer loop, E can be A and E can be B. And then for the inner loop, when E is A, the inner loop can say, what if when E is A, F is also A? And then also, what if F is um, B? And the same thing over here, when E is B, we also ask, you know, what if, uh, what can F be? So F can also be an A, or F can be a B. So let me just kind of look at this. Is that okay? So all this is doing is to show you you know, the structure of the loop or what cases we are looking at here. So when we are looking at this particular case, when E is A and F is A, then we are really asking, you know, A, what is A, B is in R, if and only, okay, do you guys want me to do the math notation or do you, is, 
Which way do you prefer? Which? And to do the map rotation, let's do the map rotation. So this one is asking, is trying to um, figure out in R E A in R. Okay. Uh, right, left. Is it left, right? There you go. That's better. Okay. So can someone tell me whether this expression is true or false? Actually, I take it back because both are both are both are A's. So I take it back. Sorry. So we have A A and A A. Okay. So in this case, is it true or false? It is true because A A is in R is true. AA is in R is also true. True if and only if true is true. Okay, very good. So now we move on to the next one. Okay, so the next one is going to be similar. Okay, so let me do the raising thing. But this time F is B. So we are looking at AB is in R if and only if BA is in R. In other words, the B is taking the place of the F. So in this case, it is not true because even though AB is in R, because we see that here, BA is not in R. So we end up with true if and only if false. Now, if and only if is also just an operator. You can look up the truth table for the value in this case, and the answer is the whole thing is false. So let me just make sure that we record that. This is true. This is false. Well. In a universally quantified expression, we need everything to be true. So as soon as we can find one case to be false, the whole thing is going to be false. So we can really just kind of stop here because we can apply short-circuited evaluation in this case. Is that okay? All right. Um, it is transitive, okay? So how do we know whether it is transitive or not? I will set up the structure, but I'm not going to actually evaluate because it's going to be yeah, it's going to be quite time consuming in this case because this time we have three loops, okay? The outer loop says your E can be A. Okay, let me back up one more level because this one answers the question of whether it is transitive or not. Oops. One. There we go. So this one answers whether it's, whether it's transitive or not. So to answer the question of whether it is transitive or not, E, F, and G are the three variables, but we have a triple loop, so that means at the outer loop, we have E being A, E being B, and that's it, because we only got two elements in X. And then in the intermediate loop, uh, we have F as our variable, so in this case, F can be A, F can be B, and then the same over here scroll up. So now we have a double loop. In other words, we have a for loop inside another for loop. But then we also have G, which is yet another nested loop. So that particular nested loop is going to be nested when E and F are known already. And then we ask the questions, what about G? So now we can say, oh, G can also be A or B. Okay, so now we just copy and paste a bunch of times like so. So that means you know, we have how many cases to evaluate? Yep, go ahead. Uh, your answer is equal to some of the nesting. Yeah, the nesting is off. Yep. But how many cases do we have to evaluate in this case? Um, okay, there are three more that are off too because the paste somehow did not paste it correctly with the indentation. There we go. So there are eight possibilities to evaluate. So we got A, B, E, and then F, and then G. So the eight cases that we need to evaluate are these eight. Okay, so this is the first one. Okay. Um, so when we evaluate this one, we are really asking the question. I will only do it for a few you know, because you know, the rest mm -hmm. is kind of boring. 
So th with this one, we know what the values of E, F, and G are. So in this case, we are really asking A, A is, okay, I need parentheses too. So we're looking at A, A is in R, and A, A is in R. Does that imply A, A is in R? And this is true. So do we see how you know, this is done? You know, how do you evaluate the kind of like a simple nested universally quantified expression? Look okay, all right. So the thing is with in this particular example, it is transitive. So the, the answer is this one is indeed transitive. So with something this simple, can we have an example that is not transitive? In other words, when x only has two elements, can we create a relation R that is not transitive? So let's take a look. Okay, I'm taking this one and stashing it at the end here. And then scroll down. And we'll make some changes to this example so that it is not transitive. All right. So uh, a quick and easy way. Okay, this is, I say it's quick and easy, but you know, we'll see. All right, so is it reflexive? Nope, it is not reflexive. Is it symmetric? Nope, it is symmetric, and it is not transitive. Okay, so let's try to figure out why. Um, does anyone have any question about why this one is not reflexive? Okay. Assuming you guys are really uh, know what reflexive means. Yes. Because A A is not in it. Okay, because in order for a relation to be relation to be reflexive, every element has to relate to itself. In this particular case, A does not relate to itself, so it's not reflexive. That's a good news. Uh, it is symmetric. Okay, it is symmetric because B B is in R. If and only if B B is in R, we good. A B is in R. If and only if B A is also in R, we good. A A is in R if and only if A A is in R. We are also good over there because A A is not in R. False if and only if false is still true. Okay, so that's why it is actually symmetric, but it is not transitive. Why is it not transitive? Can someone come up with a case for E F and G so that I can show that it is not transitive? Not transitive. And E equals to something, F equals to something, and G equals to something. So all you guys have to do is to tell me what you want to do in the question marks. Hmm? Go ahead. A, B, A, that's right, okay. So when E equals A, F equals to B, and then G equals to A, then the expression that we were looking at is not true anymore. Why? Because, okay, is E, F in R? Yes, okay. And is F, uh, F, G in R? And it's also a yes. So true and true is true. The entire left-hand side of the implication is true. But if E and G are both A, that means the right-hand side of the implication is asking, is A, A in R? A, A is not in R. So A is in R is false. So we end up with uh, true implies false, which is false. But since we have one case, okay, of having E, F, and G causing the expression on the other, other uh, document to be false, causing this expression to be false, so that means you know, the entire you know, uh, universal quantified expression, universally quantified expression is also false. And that's why the that particular example, the last one, is not transitive. In other words, if you have a reflexive, if you don't have a reflexive, that means you don't have a transitive. 
Um, only in this case. Okay. <laughs> only in this case. So if you have three elements, then there are more ways to construct a case where it is not transitive. Okay, so let's go through you know, another example, okay? But this time we have to change you know, uh, what X uh, looks like. So I just have to go back to the right uh, indentation level. I think this is the first indentation level. Okay, so let's do that. All right, so the first indentation level, and this time we want X to have three elements. With three elements, it's easy. It's much easier to construct a case. So in this case, we want X to be A, B, C. And we want R to be um, just A, B, and D. I just want to make sure, it's still recording, so it's still good. All right, so we want to backslash this, backslash this, backslash this, and one more time here. There we go. Okay, so this is the new example. You know, we have X being A, B, C, there are three elements. R has only two elements. We have A, B, we also have D, C. Okay, so we're just gonna mentally go through, you know, the uh, properties that we have gone through so far. So the first question is, is this one reflexive? Okay, that's the, I think reflexive is the easiest one to answer. Because you know, if at least one element does not reflect to itself, the answer is no. Okay, so that's an easy one. Uh, it is also not symmetric. Well, that's pretty clear because you know, A B is here, but B A is not here. B C is here, but C D is not here. Okay, so that's why it is not uh, symmetric. But it is also not transitive. It is not transitive. Because if I make C equal to A, F equal to B, and D equals to C, that will make that statement false. Because in this case, D, F is in R is true, F, G is in R is also true, but D, G is in R is false. Is that okay? So with more elements like this, it is actually easier to construct cases where it is uh, not transitive. But in this case, but your original question is, if it is not reflexive, it will make it automatically not transitive. So let me give you an example where it is reflexive, but not transitive. Okay, to come up with that example, is just having AA, BB, and CC in it. So now, in this particular example, it is reflexive, okay? It is reflexive. It is still not symmetric, and it is not transitive. Is that okay? Huh? Okay. In order to make this transitive, we can either get rid of one of these two, or we can add a, C, okay. Do we have any questions? I think uh, Joplin is losing track of the indentations. Okay. All right. Shall we move on? Because the next one is also can be confusing, but if you look at it from a mechanical perspective, it is not too bad. So this one is called anti-symmetric. First thing first, okay? Anti-symmetric is not the same thing as not symmetric. Those two are different concepts, okay? So now we have to basically mechanically look at how anti-symmetric is defined. A relation R over a set X over a set X is anti-symmetric if and only if the following is true. For every way we get a value in D, F, both X and D elements of X,
I'll figure that out when I'll do this. Kind of mysterious. Um, all right, right. So anti-symmetric. For every way to find values for E and F, they both have to be elements of X. EF is in R and FE is in R, implies E and F are the same. So we're going to apply this to all the examples that we have gone through. Go ahead and go to drop link. And then we'll go all the way back to the first one, which is this one here. X is empty, R is also empty. So the question is, is this R anti-symmetric? Well, it is because you know, there's nothing to evaluate, okay? If a for all or if a universally quantified expression has nothing to evaluate, it is automatically true. Okay, so that's an easy one. What about this one? Well, if we still, we have something to evaluate, but AA is the only thing that is looking for. It's also, it's, since it's missing, so that means you know, this R is also anti-symmetric. All right, let's look at this one. This one is anti-symmetric, anti-symmetric. This one is anti-symmetric. So you guys are all thinking, when do we get to one that is not anti-symmetric? Pretty soon. This one is not anti-symmetric. All right, so now we have to ask, why is it not anti-symmetric? So let me go to scroll, just, just to scroll here. So in order to show that this is not anti-symmetric, we kind of have to find an example, okay, that makes the expression false. So this is not anti-symmetric. Then E equals to A and B, e, uh, excuse me, F equals to B. So let me give you the whole expression, okay? When this is happening, then AB is in R and BA is in R. Let me just do extra parentheses here. Implies um, A equals B. Okay, so let's, you guys can focus on the rendered version. So this portion is pulled out of the definition of anti-symmetry. So when E equals to A, F equals to B, then AB is in R is true because we, did, we found it in R. BA is in R is also true because we found it in R. So that means this entire conjunction is true. Then we have the implication. After the implication, we are comparing E and F. A equals to B is false. So now we have the entire left-hand side being true, 
the right hand side of the implication being false, and that's the only time when implication is false. Since we can find at least one case to make the implication false, this implication, then the entire universally quantified expression is false, making it not anti symmetric. All right. Do we have any questions? Oh, let's finish up the uh, the other ones too. This one is, is it anti-symmetric or not? We're talking about this example here. It is, it is anti-symmetric. So we'll, I'll just write it here, and then we'll try to find out why. This is indeed anti. Do we have any questions about why it is anti-symmetric? Because we have A, B, and a B, C, right? But B, A is missing. In other words, the conjunction on the left-hand side of the implication, this portion here, can never be true. Because we can see A, B, but B, A is missing, which means the conjunction is false. If the conjunction is false on the left-hand side of the implication, then the implication is true, not a problem. The same thing happens when we evaluate BC. In other words, when E equals to B and F equals to C, then we can have the left-hand side of the conjunction being true, but then the right-hand side of the conjunction is going to be false. Well, that makes the whole conjunction false, if the whole conjunction is false, which means the entire left-hand side of the implication is false, then the implication is true. So we cannot make the implication false, and as a result, it is anti-symmetric. Is that okay? And then the last one is also anti-symmetric for the same reasons, basically. Mm -hmm. So we cannot have symmetric and multi-symmetric in the same time, right? Okay, so you're asking we cannot have symmetric and anti-symmetric at the same time, but we already saw a case that they happen at the same time. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> okay, so first thing first, okay, let's go back to an example where we have something that is both symmetric and anti-symmetric at the same time. This is both symmetric and anti-symmetric at the same time. This is also symmetric and anti-symmetric at the same time. Okay? So you guys may think, oh, that's only because these are trivial cases. No, not exactly. As long as you do not have a two-tuple where the uh, first and the second element of the two-tuple are different, and you have both the you, know, you you have it going in both directions, then you are still anti-symmetric. Okay. Does everybody understand what I just said? It is, it is both symmetric and anti-symmetric. Because they both are the same. Exactly. Yep. But this one is not symmetric, even though it is anti-symmetric. Because if BA is missing, if BA was here, then it would have been symmetric, but not anti-symmetric. So do we have any questions about the four properties that we have mentioned up to this point? Being reflexive, being transitive, being symmetric, and being anti-symmetric. Go ahead. How about like general factoring, I guess? Which is just like, how are these used? It's like, okay. you know when? I I'll give you an example. Okay, we'll probably get an answer. <laughs> That's a very good question. How is it applicable? 
Do you remember the entire module? You know, why is relation important in computer science? I used an example that most of you should remember because it has to do with gaming. No, it, it was a lot more fun than that. <laughs> we are trying to find the gamer of the week. Yep. Mm -hmm. So when you want to find the gamer of the week, you need to establish who is quote unquote no worse than the other player. Okay, which means they can be the same, but one can be also be better than the other. One. Okay, so. To introduce the concept of why relations is useful, and you know, okay, I will give you an example where it is partially ordered. So when all of these are present at the same time, it is called partially ordered. So I will just kind of, well, for this I can go back to my notes because it's already here. So in order to call, call a relation partially ordered, um, it has to be reflexive, it has to be anti-symmetric, and it also has to be transitive. Symmetric is not one of the requirements, okay? So I take it back, I was wrong that I said all four, it's only three, okay? Only being reflexive, anti-symmetric, and transitive. Any relation that meets these three requirements is called partially ordered, okay? So what does it mean when it's partially ordered? Partially ordered means you can determine whether two things are related um, but you cannot determine whether everything is related to everything. Okay, so I'll give you a, I'll give you an example. Okay, um, usually at this time I would give you a beer commercial. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually take a look at a beer commercial. So we go to YouTube, and this time I have to turn the audio back on, but I cannot tell. You know, I think it's still trying to play whatever it was playing before. <laughs> 